Hello. 2009 marked the 150th anniversary of the publication of Darwin's book On the Origin of Species. And it also marked the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. Our title is a parody of this particular book. The author was formerly the Professor of Public Understanding at the University of Oxford, and a number of scientists have countered this particular book. For example, Professor McGrath uh, has done, and many others have done a very good job in countering what Darwin uh, said, and in particular what Dawkins has written about Darwin. Our title is intended to collectively uh, express the idea that not just Darwin, but those who ac accept his ideas uh, are what we are talking about at this time. Of course, we don't mean any disrespect to Darwin himself. He was a very uh, fine and outstanding scientist. But rather, we're using the, the term as a sort of omnibus title in order to uh, speak about those who uphold Darwin's ideas. The question is, is it creation or is it evolution? In spite of attempts to reconcile these two ideas, we have to face the fact that they are in reality irreconcilable. Creation involves a creator, while evolution is a random process based purely on chance. Most of the material that we shall consider uh, is that advance for evolution, and we'll try to display the inadequacies that are involved. And after that, we're going to consider creation and its implications. Now, the theory of evolution, Darwinism, uh, was proposed actually jointly by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. And it was a mechanism by which it was thought new species might arise. Now, it's important to realise, of course, that the concept of a species is something that we define and is not necessarily a reality in nature. Simply expressed, the theory is the survival of the fittest. And Darwin thought that of the many uh, offspring which were produced by any particular species, only a fraction would survive to maturity. And he thought that environmental pressures would ensure that only the fittest survived. And so over a long period, that species would improve by natural selection. And there are problems with this idea. The late Professor H. Graham Cannon, a fellow of the Royal Society and formerly of Manchester University, was rather scathing in a lecture that I once listened to. He said, how do we recognise the fittest? And the answer is, of course, the fittest are the ones that survive. So then he said, well, Darwin's idea then must be the survival of those that survive. Not very profound, is it? Of course, in Darwin's day, it was recognised that the theory was not actually uh, adequate. Darwin himself um, realised that there were problems. He, he assumed that the natural variation in species would be adequate to explain evolution. And he, would, he believed that natural selection would slowly eliminate the less fit variations, and by a series of steps, then a new species would result. Of course, this process would occur slowly and would simply select for those characteristics that were already present in the species. In much the same way that someone might breed horses in order to produce a faster racing horse or a more productive corn plant. It would not produce any dramatic changes. And this is one of the weaknesses, really, of Darwin's idea. And evolutionists soon recognised that this was a problem. And it was only with the development of the science of genetics that evolutionists were provided with a possible solution to their problem. These neo or new Darwinists uh, believed that natural selection acts on mutations, that is, random genetic changes. The idea then is that random mutations in the genes of all organisms would lead to small changes in that organism's form or function. And natural selection should favour those organisms with beneficial mutations and increase their chances of survival and reproduction, hence survival of the fittest. Over a long period, these changes would accumulate and 
eventually an organism would perhaps change into a more highly evolved kind. One problem with this idea, and it still remains, is that by and large all the mutations that have been observed are not beneficial. Indeed, we have within our genetic material, in the DNA, methods for repairing errors. Of course, when that does fail, it may lead to problems like cancer. Darwin published his Origin of Species on the 24th of November, 1859. It became a bestseller. Every one of the 1,250 uh, 1, copies was sold on the very first day. Of course, it probably had a great deal of advanced publicity. There'd be a great deal of talk about this book that was going to say that men developed from monkeys. And that would have been enough of a scandal in Victorian times to ensure good sales. Very few people, it seems, have actually read the book. Indeed, in the same lecture I mentioned earlier, Professor Cannon made the point that he only knew of one other person who'd actually read on the origin of species from cover to cover, and he was a Japanese scientist who thought that a book that had changed biology so much ought to be read. Well, as a student, I decided to be the third person to have read Origin of Species from cover to cover. Professor Cannon warned that it was one of the most difficult books to read, uh, and uh, I might not f finish it, of course. Well, like most people, I got to about page 14 and again gave up. It's the most boring book that I've ever come across. Indeed, it might be uh, profitable to suggest that it's prescribed uh, for people who can't sleep. Darwin's ideas were, of course, contentious from the start. Here's a picture of uh, Samuel Wilberforce, the Bishop of Oxford, who asked Darwin uh, at this meeting, was he descended from an ape on his grandmother's or on his grandfather's side? It seems that another um, scientist, Thomas Henry Huxley, was often referred to uh, as Darwin's bulldog, took up Darwin's ideas, but there really seems to be a motive behind it that it was a, a very useful thing to challenge the church. Of course, some people saw the funny side of this, and a cartoon of, 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 Davi, of Darwin as an ape man um, w was produced, and in Punch there was this series of uh, changes, evolutionary steps, starting in chaos from which a worm emerged, and finally, as you can see by a series of uh, steps, it finally uh, evolved into Darwin himself. Well, what's the evidence for evolution? Basically, there are two main threads. The first is that it's claimed that evolution has actually been observed in action, and we also have the fossil record, which is a record of evolution over the millennia. Well, let's look at evolution in action. The, the one uh, example that's often cited is the peppered moth and the impact of the Industrial Revolution upon that moth. Now, the, the normal uh, moth is just black and white, uh, hence the pepper, the black and white pepper. And it exists, though, in two forms. The normal uh, black and white form that we see there, but there is also, or has been from time to time, a black form. And uh, when it rests on bark, um, it will be seen or not seen according to the colour of the bark. The examples that were put forward was that, of course, in the Industrial Revolution, many trees were blackened, and the black form resting on the tree trunk would, of course, uh, be much better camouflaged than the black and white form, which would stand out. You, you can see from this slide that the black form stands out far more clearly on the clean bark above, and the uh, normal form stands out far more clearly on the blackened bark below. Well, the question could be asked, is this evolution in action? Hardly. Well, why not? Well, it's quite simple. The melanic form is still the same species. It hasn't changed. It's still Biston betularia. Correlations between the abundance of the melanic black form and industrial fallout were not all that convincing. And the third and most important thing is the experiments that were done to prove that birds would spot the moth on the wrong background more readily were actually uh, not really very uh, convincing. The moths were simply pinned to the trees, uh, and this isn't how the moth normally rests. It normally rests under the branch in the junction between the trunk and the branch. And research on this has demonstrated that this is not really a very convincing example of even 
evolution in action. Indeed, it's interesting how it seems to have been dropped now from most of the textbooks. So if we can't observe evolution in action, well, perhaps we might see it in the fossil record, the record in the rocks. Now, fossils are the uh, remains of animals and plants in the rocks, and over at the various geological epochs, uh, it's possible, it is claimed, to see changes that show evolution has occurred. And, of course, the existence of fossils of kinds that we don't see in the world today is also said to support the concept of natural selection. Darwin was aware that in order to establish his theory, it would be essential to find intermediate forms between one group and another showing that, in fact, they had evolved. The fact that they were missing in his day, their absence uh, didn't cause him too much trouble. He concluded that over the years, as paleontologists explored the geology of the world, eventually these missing links would be found. And it was thought that we should be able to trace how evolution occurred from very simple organisms back in the Precambrian period through the various e epochs to the modern forms today. And we should uh, be able to see fossils. But in fact, uh, this diagram shows that in many cases, by means of the dotted lines, no fossils of these particular groups have been found in the various epochs. Well, again, this caused problems for the evolutionists, but they came up with a solution. In spite of the fact that... Um, over 150 years of research have not found these missing links, it was proposed that, in fact, this was not a problem because evolution didn't occur smoothly. Organisms remained constant for a period and then evolved very rapidly. And this idea was called punctuated equilibria. In other words, a period of equilibrium and then a sudden evolutionary change. And, of course, if this is the case... Since fossil formation is re relatively haphazard, the likelihood of these quickly evolving forms being represented in the fossil record is thereby greatly reduced, and so they appear to be missing. Well, it seems to me that this particular theory, in order to explain the absence of intermediate forms, is at least a confession that they're missing. And it seems, again, to me that it's a desperate attempt to rescue a bankrupt theory. You see, it's based on the presumption that evolution must have occurred, even though the evidence is actually lacking. And what we do find, strangely, is that there's better evidence for the fact that creatures don't change very much over large periods. We have what we call today living fossils. There are many examples of animals and plants found as fossils and still extant today. They were previously thought to be extinct, but as we've explored the world, we've found these alive and well. Uh, examples are, are the uh, Walimi pine and the coelacanth. And there are also other examples that can be found in the textbook. Well, of course, this also raises a question. How do we date the fossils? How do we know how old they are? Well, it's quite simple. Fossils are not found in what we call igneous rocks, that is, rocks like granite and so on, that are produced by volcanic uh, activity. But they're usually found in the sedimentary rocks, such as sandstone and limestone and chalk. Now, igneous rocks, it seems, can be dated by radioactive decay measurements. But it's much more difficult to do this for sedimentary rocks, and sometimes the results are actually quite con conflicting. So, in fact, what geologists tend to do is date the rocks from the fossils. And by examining characteristic fossils in a particular rock, uh, you can estimate which geological period or epoch it belongs to. And then, of course, once you've determined that, you can determine um, the age of the fossils by the age of the rocks. Now, you'll see that, in a sense, this is a circular argument. And while some people might argue, well, no, that's been broken by the use of radioactive decay, uh, decay methods and uh, a more absolute measurement has been made. In reality, the geological periods were named long before radioactive methods were actually uh, f thought of. For example, characteristic rocks in, in Britain and Europe are named from regions. The Cambrian, the oldest rocks, are derived from a tribe of in Wales. The Jurassic, which of course is very famous, Jurassic is named after the Jura Mountains. The Cretaceous from the English chalk, the Carboniferous from the coal measures and so on. 
And this system is still in use. It hasn't been modified, even though some scientists believe you can derive ages from radioactive methods. Well, you could ask then, well, if that's the problem, can't we just look at a cliff and work out that the oldest rocks must be at the bottom and the youngest rocks at the top? Uh, well, that, that is true, um, although it is interesting sometimes that the sequence seems to get out of uh, kilter and geologists then have to come up with quite complicated explanations as to how that might be the case, how it came about. Uh, for example, we haven't a cliff anywhere in the world that has all the geological strata evident. If there was such a, a, a cliff uh, from the Cambrian period to the recent, it would have to be 84 miles high, or 12 times the height of Mount Everest. Now, the Grand Canyon, impressive though it is, in order to contain all the strata would have to be 85 times deeper. There's another way of deciding how probable evolution is, and that's to look at the mathematical probability. If evolution is based on random events, what are the chances it would result in life in the first place and ultimately human beings? Now, it has been claimed, as you probably know, that if you had a large enough n number of monkeys typing on enough typewriters, um, even though they're typing at random, you would eventually get the complete works of Shakespeare. That's what's claimed. In fact, this was actually tried a while ago with six monkeys, and after a month, there were 50 pages of, of type, but not a single word of English. Not even the uh, indefinite article, a, ah, or the personal pronoun, I. In fact, one scientist sat down and calculated how probable it would be. And he took a single Shakespeare sonnet, the one beginning, Shall I compare thee to a rose, in which there are 488 letters ignoring the spaces. And he did the calculation. The probability that we would obtain a single Shakespearean sonnet at random is 10 to the 690. That is, one followed by 690 zeros. And indeed, he went on to calculate that if you had every particle in the universe working like a computer, doing a million calculations a second, from the beginning of time, you still wouldn't get, at random, a single sonnet of Shakespeare. The universe would have to be 10 to the 600 times bigger than it actually is. And yet everyone seems to accept that monkeys could do it. It is fascinating to reflect that what a monkey typing at random cannot achieve, a human mind could. So how likely then is evolution? Well, it's possible to calculate the probability that life evolves, shall we say, from a very simple organism by a series of mutations from something like an amoeba to a horse. A simple single-celled creature, no bigger than a, a pinhead, smaller than a pinhead in fact, to something that we all recognise a horse. Well, how probable is that? The facts are that the odds are very much against evolution having occurred. And I want to quote now from a book by Sir Gavin de Beer, who was a former director of the Natural History Museum in London. And he, he said this, Those who invoke mathematical improbability against natural selection can be refuted out of their own mouths, he claimed. H.J. Muller has estimated on the existing knowledge of the percentage of mutations that are beneficial, and a recent estimate of the number of mutations that would be necessary to convert an amoeba into a horse, based on the average magnitude of the effects of mutations, the number required on the basis of chance alone, if there were no natural selection, would be of the order of 1,000 raised to the power of 1 million. How big is 1,000 raised to the power of 1 million? Well, it's 1 followed by three million noughts. And it's worth reflecting that there are only 10 to the 80, that's 10 followed by 80 noughts, particles in the whole of the universe. But the evolutionists are not deterred. Sir Gavin goes on, this impossible and meaningless figure serves to illustrate the power of natural selection in collecting favorable mutations and minimizing waste of variation 
For horses do exist, and they have evolved. This reminds me of that famous comment, don't confuse me with facts, my mind is made up. If you find it hard to appreciate how big these numbers are, another scientist put it like this, and I can understand this a little better myself. The chances that life just occurred on Earth are about as unlikely as a typhoon blowing through a junkyard and constructing a Boeing 747. In other words, you start with this, a typhoon comes along, and you end up with that. Now, if you can accept that, then fine, evolution is possible. But I think there are very few people in this world who would accept that as a probability of evolution. There's another problem that's occurred recently for evolutionists, and that's the concept of irreducible complexity. Um, there's a, a book by uh, Michael Behe, a professor of biochemistry in the United States, and he called his book Darwin's Black Box. And he challenged evolutionary theory by demonstrating that biochemical systems have an irreducible complexity. And he defined it like this. Irreducible complexity is a system of well-matched interacting parts that contrib contribute to a basic function, wherein the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. This means, of course, that if there are parts of organisms which can't be any simpler than their present complexity without failing, then they must have evolved fully made, because anything less just wouldn't work. Indeed, Darwin himself recognised that the idea was an important one. He actually says, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Now, Dawkins, the author of the book that we started with, says this, evolution is very possibly, in actual fact, always gradual. But it must be gradual when it's being used to explain the coming into existence of complicated, apparently designed objects like eyes. For if it is not gradual in these cases, it ceases to have any explanatory power at all, we are back to miracle, which is simply a synonym for the total absence of explanation. Now, it's very interesting. He uses phrases like very possibly in actual fact. Well, which is it, possible or fact? B uses a homely example to demonstrate what he has in mind. He points to the modern mousetrap. It consists of no more than seven essential uh, moving parts, including the cheese. Yet, if any one of these is missing, the trap uh, fails to work. It's a simple but very useful example of irreducible complexity. And much of molecular biology is like this. If you take any part from it, then the system won't work. This still works without cheese, because I can do that. Now, one of the wonderful examples is that of the molecular motor. Here's a, a, a drawing, a, a diagram of the flagellum that uh, propels a bacterium uh, through liquid. Its construction at the molecular level is remarkably reminis reminiscent of a modern electric motor, but scientists tell us it's far, far more efficient. Here's an example of a complex structure that would not work properly if any part of it was missing. And evolutionists have to explain how it could come together complete and perfect and functional, just like that. What's the explanation, then, for the uh, large changes that must be accounted for in the evolutionary theory? You see, so far we've just been looking at uh, movements, say, from a, a peppered moth to a black form of it. The big problem is how do we get from very simple creatures, like an amoeba, to complicated creatures, like a horse? And one of the most pressing problems, and still not yet answered, is how did the invertebrates, the animals without backbones, how did they change into the ones like us that have backbones? You see, the problem is that the body structure of invertebrates, animals without backbones, worms, shellfish, and so on, is actually inverted in comparison to the structure of our bodies. The invertebrates have a nervous system at the front, on the ventral side, uh, while in 
vertebrates, backboned animals, it is at the dorsal side. Invertebrates have their hearts and circulatory system located at the back, whereas our heart, uh, and that of other vertebrates, is at the front. J just a little diagram might help to m make the point. Um, this drawing shows uh, the, the gut, the green part in the middle, the red represents the blood circulatory system, and the blue, the nervous system. And you'll see the one above is the invertebrate, with its nervous system below and its blood system above, and the lower one is the vertebrate, in which these are reversed. And some scientists have actually said, ah, oh, well, one of them may be flipped over, and rather like living like that, and, and remain that way. The present favoured explanation is even more remarkable. It is claimed that these are our ancestors. It's a picture of adult sea squirts. They're sessile marine creatures staying in one part and filtering seawater to get their food, but they have a free swimming larva that swims away and settles again to form an adult sea squirt. Now, the point is made that this little larva is very much like a tadpole. And it's suggested that, in fact, this is really our ancestor. That is, that the vertebrates, the chordate animals, are supposed to have originated from a sea squirt larva by a process called neoteny. Uh, that is, it attained reproductive capacity when it was young, and it never grew up, like Peter Pan. It remained young forever, but it became uh, sexually mature and was able to reproduce. Now, that's the best that can be done. There's no evidence that this occurred, really. But you see, an explanation has to be found. And you'll be amazed at the number of ideas that have been put forward in order to get around this particular problem. Is evolution still credible? Well, this is a quotation that sums it up beautifully, doesn't it? Evolutionary theory is now one of the main myths of our time. And Behe himself made this point. B said in his book, the fact that none of these fundamental problems is even addressed, let alone solved. And that's a very strong indication that Darwinism is an inadequate framework for understanding the origin of complex biochemical systems. So we can reasonably ask, is evolution actually scientific? Well, science advances by observing phenomena. And then a scientist proposes an explanation of what he observes, a hypothesis or a theory. And then this is tested by predicting from this theory what would happen under certain circumstances, and you perform an experiment to test it. And if this doesn't seem to work out, then the only thing science can do is reject those ideas that fail the test. And it's not often appreciated, but science actually advances by disproving things, not by proving them. You see, you can't always prove something. There may be another explanation. But if your explanation doesn't fit the facts, then it's disproved. So, is evolution scientific? Well, <laughs> evolution is a theory which can't be tested. You, you can't go into the past and see what happened. You can't observe it. You can't experiment. Nor can you predict. No one can say what a horse will eventually evolve into. So again, it falls down. And of course, it takes too long anyway if you were to observe what a horse was going to change into if it did. It would well be beyond the lifetime of many, many scientists. And as we said, any evidence which is contrary to the theory demolishes it. Well, I think some of the evidence we put forward at least shows that evolution is not a tenable idea. And if it's untenable, then creation seems to me to be the only alternative. And the simple statement at the beginning of our Bible says it all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this theme isn't just there, it runs through the whole Bible. Isaiah makes the point, um, quoting God here, that it's God who made the earth and created mankind. His own hands stretched out the heavens and he marshaled the starry hosts. The writer to the Hebrews in the New Testament says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. And that's a current theory in science, isn't it? The Bing Bang said it came into existence. The writer of the Hebrews said that 2,000 years ago. 
More important for Christians, of course, the Lord Jesus endorsed the account of creation in Genesis. He actually asked the question, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? Or again, but at the beginning of creation God made them male and female. And he also said in his Olivet Prophecy, pray that it will not take place in the winter because those days will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never be equaled again. So, creation or evolution? Well, it seems to me there's only one answer. As a scientist, I have no problems with the early chapters of the book of Genesis. This is because I also take into account other evidence. For example, Bible prophecy, which has been fulfilled with remarkable detail. Or again, the irrefutable evidence for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or the evidence of the conviction of the first Christians and the rapid growth of the early church in spite of persecution. It's not Christians who are deluded, but those who prefer to avoid the flaws in the theory of evolution. Thank you.